Josephine Baker represents bravery, freedom, and joy. This is the breakout performance of the legend Josephine Baker. She was dancing the Charleston. In France, nobody knew about this dance. 1920s Paris had never seen anything quite like it. She's feeding into this whole idea of the exoticism of Africa that the French held. She took racist clichés, she laughed at them, and then she used them for her own ends. From this moment, Josephine Baker would be catapulted to fame to become the world's first black superstar. In this special program, Brian Boyan Baker tells us what it was like to be the child of one of the most famous performers of the 20th century. She was also a war hero and a civil rights activist. Nearly 50 years after her death, Josephine Baker is being honored with a place in France's revered Pantheon, a monument reserved for celebrated French icons. She's the sixth woman and the first black woman to receive the honor. When did you realize how famous your mother was? When I was a kid, not really. I realized that she was famous when I was an adult and, and that she was uh, courageous. What did she tell you about her own childhood? She was always speaking about our, the present and the future for us. She was thinking that uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have to know so much about her past. Freda Josephine MacDonald est née le 3 juin 1906 à Saint-Louis, Missouri. C'est moi, ni noir, ni blanche, ni rouge. Tout ça mélangé, ça fait du café au lait. We're doing our interview in the new Passy Theatre in Paris, where a show about Josephine Baker's early life is playing. Clarisse Kaplan plays the young Josephine. Je commençais à travailler très tôt chez les gens pour faire le ménage et nourrir la petite famille parce qu'on était pauvres. Her mother was very hard on her. She went to work for white people who mistreated her, and the fact that she was mixed race was hard, because white people thought she was too black, and black people thought she was too white. How did she learn to dance? She didn't really learn. She, she was a dancer when she was a kid, in the street already, at home. She invents a character where she knocks her knees together. She makes funny faces and goes cross-eyed. She was noticed in New York by a lady called Caroline Dudley. She'd been tasked by the director of Paris's Champs-Élysées Theatre to create a show that in 1925 became a massive hit. It was the Revue Negre. Extraordinaire, c'est la Revue Negre. Elle vient de Philadelphie. Avec la Revue Nègre, elle débarque à Cherbourg, un mois plus tard au Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. C'est le scandale. People either loved it or hated it. It was done at a time when France was sort of ripe for an experience that they felt was perhaps primitive, but because of its primitiveness, pure. This review had such success that Paris felt in love with my mother and proposed her to stay forever. This was the first time a white man offered her his hand to help her step down from the train. It was the first time a white man opened a door for her and served a coffee. They were welcomed as performers and they could walk down the very street that led up to this theater and enter into the front door. So at the age of 19, this young woman left behind a segregated America for a new, freer life in France. She soon became the toast of the town. She was the muse of the Cubists, Picasso. They all wanted to paint her. Calder made a Josephine Baker sculpture. The big fashion designers wanted to dress her. Even Beyonce, recent, in recent years, wore that banana skirt. Not only Beyonce, but also Rihanna, and also Cocteau before, 
and Man Ray, the photographer. Why was she so fascinating? I think that this kind of uh, energy, generosity, and a way of being simple with a sexy body and a nice face, she, she had a charm uh, unique. By the 1940s, as an established star, Josephine Baker embarked on her most daring adventure yet. She became a spy for the French resistance. Et voici Joséphine, oui, le lieutenant Joséphine Baker, qui rapporte d'une tournée en Égypte un chèque de 4 millions et demi de francs destiné à la résistance. When the Germans and the Nazis were invading France, she did, decided to cooperate with the resistance directly because she, she was feeling that uh, France had given to her so much, she had to, to give back, to fight the racism and the anti-Semitism. So she decided to hide a lot of resistance in her castle and to become a kind of secret agent. As she was a star, she had access to the embassies, where there were key people, and she was able to collect very important information for the intelligence. Not many French people signed up to the resistance right at the start of the war in 1939. Were you there when she received France's highest medal, the Legion of Honor? Uh, yes, but I was five years old, so I was not really interested by that. So I, I asked to the general in chief uh, of the French army if I could go in his helicopter. That was more interesting for me. Following the war in 1947, Josephine Baker married French orchestra leader Joe Boyon. They spent most of their time at their 15th century Chateau Le Milande. She longed for children. Afin de prouver au monde que les hommes peuvent vivre en paix, Josephine Baker, qui n'a jamais pu avoir d'enfants, décide d'adopter des orphelins de toute race et de toute religion. J'ai eu cette idée parce que j'ai vu tellement de incompréhension entre les êtres humains, les soi-disant adultes, et j'étais sûr qu'avec mes tout petits enfants innocents, ils pouvaient donner un exemple absolu de la fraternité mondiale. The children were called the Rainbow Tribe, and they truly were rainbow. There were Asian children, there were um, children of African descent, there were French children. She raised them all together in this chateau called Les Milandes in the Dordogne, which is now a museum in her honor. You had 10 children. Ben oui, non, dix garçons et deux filles. Dix, douze. Douze, douze. Heureusement que les filles vous entendent pas. <laughs> How did you come to be adopted? I am born when there was a war, let's say an independentist war between Algerian and French people. My uh, parents, they were killed. After that, six months after that, she was singing for an, an orphanage and she discovered me with other kids. I was smiling. Oh, she looked at me and uh, she saw that as well. I was born the same day and the same month as her, the 3rd of June. And she said, oh, this baby, I, uh, oh, it's, it's a sign. And what did she tell you later on about why she wanted to adopt um, you and your brothers and sisters? First of all, she, she wanted a big family, like a big uh, Italian mama. And uh, by the way, on the Sunday evening she was doing, when she was there, she was doing her favorite plate, spaghetti uh, bolognese way. We were all around the table. Even if she had biological children, she would have adopted because she wanted big family with all colors. And growing up in Le Milan, the chateau, was it like a fairy tale? It was like if you were in a permanent uh, vacation colony. We were 12, always playing and in a big castle. Uh, we enjoyed it. The only thing is that we are thinking we are, we are not very uh, normal family. Uh, and our mother is not very normal too in a certain way. You came from heaven by the 1950s, she was a worldwide performer, a war hero, and she lived in a castle. 
But her mission for equal rights and social justice was far from over. In 1951, she went to the United States and she performed in several places. She refused to perform for segregated audiences. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. And in 1963, at the march where possibly the most famous speech in history was made, Josephine Baker also took to the podium. She was the only woman to speak there, and she wore her French military uniform with all of her medals displayed, speaking for about 20 minutes. And so she sends a double message. I stand beside you in the fight against segregation. And at the same time, I chose the French Republic because it was the French Republic that made me. Josephine Baker continued her humanitarian work until the end of her life, and she never stopped touring. Chaque jour, on a une ride de plus quand on a âge comme moi, ou n'importe quoi de plus. Difficulté de, de bouger peut-être, aussi pas si, si souple qu'avant. Mais tout ça, c'est tout naturel. J'ai de la chance de pouvoir euh, être avec vous ce soir. Elle a 69 ans, Joséphine Baker revient à Paris, Paris dont elle disait, on ne peut pas finir sa carrière ailleurs. Puisque Paris, c'est une femme Paname Appelez donc Paris, Paname Paname the show she does in Paris is called Josephine. It's her last time on stage, exactly 50 years after her first appearance in 1925. And it's a triumph. The Rolling Stones are there, there's royalty, and international stars at the Bobino Theatre. Bien agréable de pouvoir retrouver la famille. La famille pour moi, c'est tout le monde et surtout le public qui m'a fait. And at the end of her 14th performance, she's tired. She goes home, she takes a nap, and she dies. Ils sont venus par milliers pour pleurer celle qui a enchanté leur jeunesse. Cette grande vieille dame disparue qui, huit jours avant, les stupéfiait encore par son talent, par son courage. Cette petite fille d'esclave noire qui a conquis le monde par sa générosité de cœur, comme le rappelle dans son homélie le curé de la Madeleine. What was it like when you saw all those people gather for her funeral when she died? Uh, we were uh, uh, doing our uh, school time in Monte Carlo, but we could see on TV uh, a lot of people, a lot of the, of the audience of my mother and some um, military people, some politics, some artists. How old were you? 17 years old. People see her as this tremendous icon um, for stage performance. They see her as this representative of civil rights. They see her as this person who was willing to give her life for her adopted country of France. There are significant moments for each of those things. But I think Josephine would have wanted to be remembered most for being a good mother. What do you think about your mother being honored with a place in the Pantheon? An honor, historical. It was the President uh, Macron told me that uh, she will stay uh, as an example of uh, the French Republican value. In a world of divisions, where things are breaking apart, through her entrance into the Pantheon, she's bringing us together. And quite frankly, it feels good. What do you think she would have said about being honored with a place in the Pantheon? She would have been surprised first. Then she would have maybe a pro protest, saying, no, it's too much. But if General de Gaulle, president of France, would have said, Josephine, the nation and I have decided to put you when you will be dead in the Pantheon, she would have said, yes, my general, and then she would have been very moved and proud. Mm -hmm.